Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. And what we're going to do is continue uh, doing our series of first fruits. We've been doing this about a uh, month and a half to two months. And uh, God has been showing us some tremendous things. Anytime you look at first fruits, you want to draw your attention to increase. First fruits is always tied to increase. So uh, last week we talked in 1 Samuel chapter 18. We left off at verse 5. And we covered the fact that when you are moving to another level in your life, you always must offer God first fruits. And he began to show us a different aspect that I never even taught about before until last week, and it was your attitude. How's your attitude when you move into a new level in your life? We use the example of Jonathan and David, and when you look at uh, chapter 18 in 1 Samuel, David is moving from the field to the palace. We actually see in verse 2, the Bible declares that Saul took him that day and would not let him go no more home to his father's house. In verse 2, it shows us David's life changed forever. He was in the field. He was a shepherd boy. We understand that he ended up fighting Goliath, defeating him. Saul then tells David, you're going to go to the palace, and he removed him from the field. And many times uh, what gets us in trouble is the fact that when we are moving from the field to the palace, we do not have the proper attitude. We are uncomfortable. God is pushing us to a place that we need to rely on him more. But in that transition, if you're immature, you normally would talk to immature people, and the immature people would uh, confirm your immature feelings. So imagine, if you would, David moving from the field to the palace, and now there's a whole nother culture, but he's constantly going back to the field, telling the people in the field what the folks in the palace are doing. Chances are, guess what the f people in the field are going to do? They're going to say that everybody in the palace is wrong, that the stuff they're doing is unnecessary. The downside with that, they're not the ones headed to the palace. So if David takes that negative mindset into where he's going, it would kill what God is about to do in his life. And so that's connected to attitude. So one of the things that we want to focus on, that as you move into the next level, watch your attitude, how, how you're handling things. It, it's one thing to feel some way internally. It's another thing to start voicing it. It's another thing to let your disposition shift. So you got to watch your attitude. So we want to continue, if you would, a part two inside of that series. And we want to start at verse 6. So we're in 1 Samuel chapter 18, uh, verse 6. And it says, And it came to pass, as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with the tavern and with joy and with instruments of music. Watch this. Verse 7 says, And the women answered one another, so they are talking to each other as they played, say, and said, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. Verse 8 says, And Saul was very wroth, and the saying, here's the thing, the saying displeased him, and he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands. To me, they have ascribed but thousands. Here's the kicker. What, and what can he have more but the kingdom? And what can he have more but the kingdom? Here's something interesting I want, I want to point out uh, that I want you to see. Now, here's the thing. David now behaves himself wisely in verse 5. That's the first time we see it in this chapter. You're going to see David behave himself wisely three separate occasions, okay? And so now Saul then promotes David. David is over the armies. He is going up in rank. They fight the Philistines. As they're coming back from a victory, people are now, the women are starting to sing, and they, they make up their own song to each other, and they, Saul overhears the music, and he, he pays attention to the lyrics, and the lyric, lyric says, Saul on a thousand, David his ten thousand, and watch this, Saul became mad. Watch this, in verse 8, he was wroth, and it displeased him of what somebody else said. Here's what I need you to recognize. Now, as God moves you to another level, you're going to have to deal with your mindset of dealing with the field versus the palace. If you handle yourself wisely, promotion is going to come to you. That next level of promotion is now going to cause other people to begin to appreciate what God is doing in your life. Here's the thing I need you to recognize and see. As they begin to tell you how great you are, as they begin to tell you how gifted you are, as they begin to tell you how much they, they are grateful you've been in their life, here's the thing that you've got to be prepared for. You got to be prepared that that conversation is going to produce another level of warfare. The same conversation that brings you praise is going to now call someone to despise what is being said about you. Here's the key to this. 
you have to have reserve on the inside of your heart, ladies and gentlemen, because you got to understand David is not doing anything outside of being who God wants him to be. Women are praising him. Saul is mad at him. Women are praising him. Saul is mad at him. So here's the thing I need you to, to pay attention to. Here's the thing I want you to draw your attention to. Saul is mad at David because of something that somebody else is saying. David has not got these women together. He's not telling them, I want y'all to say this about me. He's not doing nothing. They're simply voicing how they feel about David. And Saul is now beginning to have an attitude with David based upon what somebody else has said. Here's what I need you to understand. Here's what I need you to see. You cannot control how someone else receives your testimony of increase. I want to say that again. You cannot control how someone else receives your, your increase. In other words, something good can happen to you, and you go and tell them, hey, I got a promotion on my job. They can look at you, smile, and say congratulations, but the truth of the matter, at that very moment that they hear that you got the promotion, they begin to feel a certain way internally against your promotion. It could be someone right in your midst. It can be somebody across the table. It can be someone on the other side of the, the department. It can be someone you never met before. And you can post something on social media and say, I thank God for his increase. I got this promotion. Someone, they don't even have to know you personally, can hate the fact that you said that God has done something increase in your life so here's the thing that you got to be careful of you got to make sure in the midst of everything that that's going on around you you're not responsible for who gets mad you're not responsible who praises you you're responsible for your attitude how are you going to respond here's the thing I want to encourage you you got to remain humble when people begin to praise you because while they're praising you somebody else can be talking about you Matter of fact, the same person who praised you at one level can hate you at the next level. So because you cannot control the actions of other people, you must make sure you control your own actions. So I need you to stay even keel. That when God begins to bless you and start increasing you, don't get high-minded, don't exalt yourself. And when people begin to praise you and stroke your ego and tell you all of this, it's up to you when you get along with God. Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity. Why? Because here's the thing. I don't want you to side-eye people for this, but here's the thing I need you to understand. The next level of your warfare is going to come through conversations. And many times we embrace the conversations that sound good, not understanding that those conversations are setting you up for another type of conversation because God has elevated you. Well, let me put it like this. When, if God is going to elevate your life, he's going to increase you. That means more eyes are going to be on you. With more people comes more problems. And so the problem is... I see many people, their, their idea of God blessing them is, is God increasing them to make them famous. Now understand that you cannot handle the warfare of becoming more popular. It may make your ego feel good, but the truth of the matter is that because all you're thinking about that if, if a thousand people see me, then a thousand people enjoy me. Here's the truth of the matter. If a thousand people see you, ten may like you. And the other 990 may start talking against you. And now you're, you're wondering, why do I feel like this? I don't know what it is. I don't feel quite sick. My head, my head is not hurting. It's warfare. That's why you can't sleep. That's why the enemy is fighting you in your dreams. It's because you have unlocked the doorway of another level of warfare against the enemy. And let me say it like this. Not just you unlocking it. This is so, so amazing that when people begin to talk and people don't understand the seriousness of this. Immature individuals are the very first ones that the enemy used to, to create warfare because they don't understand the power of the tongue. So, so they just talk. They, their, emo, their emotions rule their conversation. So now if they feel some type of way, they just begin to talk, not understanding well, what is happening in, in the spirit realm. And so the very person that you're talking about is now finding themselves going through different, a different level of warfare that was initiated through your conversation. And so here's the thing that you got to understand. David is now is about to endure warfare. Watch this. Because of how Saul is interpreting what somebody else is saying about David. Now, here's the difference. I see people who self-inflict themselves. And when they do stuff that they don't supposed to do, now warfare comes. They want to uh, contribute that to God is growing me. God is elevating me. God is uh, releasing his anointing. No, that's self-inflicted. I'm talking about when there's increase in your life and all you're doing is just being who God wants you to be. But 
but now you're finding yourself facing another type of warfare that's, that's attached to the praise that comes from you being who God called you to be. David is just doing his job. He, he's doing what he's been doing. He's trying to navigate with this new level. He's trying to listen to what Jonathan is saying. Jonathan is mentoring him. He's going out, having been over men before, still trusting the same God in battle. Now he, he's fighting the bear. He fought the lion. He's fought Goliath. Now he's fighting the Philistines. He's getting, he's getting promotion after promotion. And women are praising him. And the very Saul that told him to come into the palace sees it, hears it. And here's what, what Saul says. Watch this. It took me to this morning to see this. At the end of verse 8, Saul says, what and what can he have more but the kingdom? This is what the Holy Spirit gave me. God knew that he was firing Saul to hire David to be king. God knew because he's omniscient, he's all-knowing. Watch this. He then tells Samuel, who is the most spiritual person connected to God, what his intentions are. Samuel is interceding for Saul as he should intercede for his leadership. And I want to encourage you to do that as well. Even if you don't like leadership, the Bible doesn't say talk against them. The Bible says pray for them. In your prayer, here's how you can tell if a person is interceding for their leadership. It's, it's impossible to inter intercede for your leadership and backbite against your leadership. It's impossible. Because the conversation that you want to have that's displeasing, you take it before God. And if you're doing it in the presence of the Lord, it doesn't cause demonic activity. When you do it with your friend or the person who agree with you, it, it, it now causes demonic activity. Just, just a side note, just something for those of us who feel we mature. But, but, but the truth of the matter, if you're spending more time interceding, you don't have time to gossip. I'm just saying. So, but here's the thing that you got to understand. God knew that he was firing Saul to hire David. God allowed Saul to fire himself through disobedience. God allowed David, watch this, to now get promoted, and David didn't even know he was being interviewed. God shares with Samuel, stop interceding for Saul. And here's the thing that people don't want to believe and receive. God can have someone interceding on your behalf who is spiritually mature than you. But God can also tell them, I'm done. Let's focus on something else. Samuel's heart is broken because God tells Samuel, the same one who interceded from the beginning said, Lord, they say they want a king. He said, well, let's give them Saul. Let's give them what they want. Samuel intercedes for Saul. God tells Samuel, leave it alone. There's somebody who's watching me now, and you've been laboring, you've been praying, you've been fasting, and you want God to do something in somebody's life. Here's the thing. What you're sensing now is that maybe God is saying, I'm done. I'm moving on. Now, we want to believe that God is tremendously patient, which he, he is. We want to believe that he's tremendously loving and kind and merciful and all those different things. But well, why don't we don't want to believe that God sometimes move on? And so he tells, Sam, he tells Samuel, guess what? I done moved on. I done found me someone else. Some people believe that God is not going to do anything in earth unless he do it through them. Now, understand, the moment that you disqualify yourself and say, God, I don't want to do it, God can move on to somebody who will. We want God to be patient with us for 40 years, but we're not patient with God over one firing, over one repo, over one foreclosure. And so God moves on from, from Saul. Here's the thing. God knows that Saul is disqualified. He tells Samuel. Samuel then tells Saul, watch this. God knows that Samuel is, Saul is disqualified. Samuel knows, but then Saul finds out through Samuel. God has rent the kingdom from you. Just as you have rent my clothes, your kingdom has been rent. Watch this, guys. David still don't know that he's the next in line. So everything David is doing right now is predicated on him getting to the next level without him knowing the importance of why that next level is in front of him. Here's the thing. I know it's, it's real popular now to, to go to people and tell them, thus says the Lord, and unlock the prophecies and all that wonderful thing. But here's the thing that I need you to understand. Timing is more important than being right. Just to prove your gift to somebody else and run and tell them what the Lord is showing you, but they are not mature enough to handle the information, would do them a detriment than to be a blessing to them. If they move too fast, try to cover too much ground too quick, they're going to encounter warfare that's going to destroy them. 
And the thing that you said that the God's going to do in their life won't ever happen. Why? Because you told an immature person too fast that this is something that God want to do. Instead of telling them that God want to do it, here's wisdom. Just start working on their character. Get their person ready. And then the other stuff will fall in line. And so David still don't know that God's preparing him to be king. Watch this. And Saul does not know that David has the potential of being king to take his place until verse 8. Verse 8 hits, and then Saul says, hold up. What more could he have but the kingdom? Saul knew that his time was up, but he never knew who could take my place until verse 8. Watch this. David still don't know. Watch verse 9. And Saul eyed David from that day forward. Saul eyed him. You, you know what this means. So some of you ain't ready for this, this type of warfare. You say you won't increase, but you're not ready for this type of warfare. This type of warfare is every time a person gets in your presence, they feel some kind of way. It, it, watch this. You don't even have to do anything to them. But they, they must find a reason to hate you. They must find a reason to talk about you. They must find a reason to be the catalyst of the enemy using them to, to watch this, to speak against what it is that God wants to do in your life. Here's the crazy part. Here's the crazy part. And so how do I know some of you are not ready for this next level? Why? Because the moment that somebody is uncomfortable around you, you feel the need to make them comfortable again. <laughs> You don't want them to be uncomfortable. But here's the thing you got to understand. If God is going to elevate you, he needs to elevate you to a place that makes somebody uncomfortable. And so if you're, you're trying to be a people pleaser and you want everybody to be comfortable, here's the thing. All you're saying is, God, I'm more concerned about those around me feeling comfortable than you feeling comfortable about choosing me. So you have to make a choice. You have to make a decision. Now, I'm not saying we can't talk about it and see if there's something I can do different. Here's what I do understand. I understand that me and you can set up a meeting and I understand that you and I can talk. The Bible says you have an alt with your brother to go to him and talk to him. Here's what I found out, though. I found out that if people have talked about you prior to y'all meeting, when they finally get in front of you, they're not going to express themselves the way they have been expressing themselves about you to other people. <laughs> How do you know? Because when you ask them what's going on, they're going to stutter in their conversation. They're stuttering because they're trying to figure out what's appropriate right now for me to say. They're not going to be as free as they was when they was talking about you to somebody else. And so here's the thing. You know what's also going on in them. What's also going on is, is that as they are running across their heart, what it is they're trying to figure out to say, they are also being revealed that the thing that they felt about you may not necessarily be as sincere as they thought it was. So in other words, here's the thing. They have an issue with you, and so they run to other people. And especially if the other people also have an issue. They just talk freely. They can be on the phone for hours, and you're the topic of discussion. Remember what God gave us uh, 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 probably four, five, six months ago? When we, around Thanksgiving, I think the, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, the week of Thanksgiving, God began to reveal to me. He says, now, if you're, you got to be able to handle your name being a topic of discussion at the dinner table before your name can be the topic of discussion in boardrooms. In other words, here's what I need you to see. I said this last week, and I want to reiterate this to somebody's heart. Never ask God to stop people from talking about you. Don't do that. Don't allow the pressure of today to cause you to forfeit everything. No, the next level needs someone to be talking about you. So don't get caught up in what somebody's saying. You say, Lord, I just don't like people talking about me. Lord, Lord I pray that nobody talk about me. No, don't do that. Here's what I, I encourage you to do. The Bible says that you can take every conversation and condemn it. Just focus on that. Every conversation I condemn, every tone that rises against me, I condemn. In other words, I pronounce whatever's been said, I pronounce it having no power. So in other words, if I'm spiritually stronger than the person that's talking, I have the right and authority in the spirit realm to counsel out your conversation. So why would I let that be a topic of discussion with my mental? No, I just keep moving forward. It can take me two seconds to undo what somebody else has said for an hour. Why? Because I have more authority in the spirit realm. So it doesn't mean I'm not going to get the backlash of what's being said, but what it means is it won't prosper. So all I got to do is condemn every tongue that rises against me, I condemn. And so while you're praying, you can say that for three seconds, and here's what you're saying, that I pronounce it guilty against my destiny. You can do it. That's no problem. 
but I pronounce it guilty. So whatever it is that you want to see happen to me is not going to happen. Matter of fact, it's going to do more to you. And so here's the thing I need you to prepare yourself for. Be prepared for people to be more enraged after God continue to bless you after they've already talked against you. Be prepared for that. And other, so, so here's what happens. A person talks about you and they think they want, they want to see you be sabotaged. They want to sabotage what God is doing. They, want, they hope that you fail. And God keep blessing you even though they hope that you fail. That's going to enrage them more. Now, God has continued to bless them to show, continue to bless you to show them that they're not fighting against you. They're fighting against the hand of God. So it's an opportunity really for them to repent. But their pride won't allow them to do it. So what, they, what, they, what typically happens, they just continue to get more enraged, not understanding while you are focusing your energy against me, while you're focusing your frustration against me, you're really mad because God is choosing me. But you're not acknowledging that you disqualified yourself. It's somebody that's listening to me now, and I feel in my heart uh, as I was in prayer this morning that some of you are at this place and the, and because of your immaturity, the enemy is really using you to speak against those that God has chosen. Part of the frustration is one, at one point you was chosen too. Your decisions disqualified you. How do we know who is it that God has spoken to now? God is concerned about you. Here's, let me sum it up like this. At one point, you was the very people that now you hate. It used to be you were known as the church person. Now you make statements, I don't fool with church people. So what, make, so what are you now? Well, I'm just spiritual. Well, that sounds real good. But have you noticed that the same people that at one time was having an issue with you uh, because you was growing in the things of God has now became very comfortable with you? Have you noticed that the people that you, when you were spiritually strong, you could communicate with, you could fellowship with, but now your fellowship is with those that are backsliding, those that are gossiping, those that are drinking, smoking, sexing, doing all of it. Their lifestyle is totally contrary to the word, and you feel more comfortable with them. And you, you're saying, no, they just keep it real. They're not fake. Uh, they, it's not that they're not fake. It, it, the thing is they're not relying on God to change them. And so whereas you got somebody that I got to get, not to say that all church people are perfect. We're here to uh, serve a perfect God to be conformed to his image. The, 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 the downside is this. We recognize that we need help. We recognize that we're work still in progress. And we're seeking after this God who is perfect to fix us. Those that you're comfortable with, they're not seeking after God. They're just being more entangled in their sin. I don't even have an issue with it. The problem I have, my brother, my sister, backsliding is not a one-time event. It's, it's, it's a gradual process. I'm talking to you today because you fit in that category of a backslider. When the Bible says that God is married to the backslider, it means that I'm married to a person that was once in covenant with me. The only way you can backslide, you had to first once be in covenant. You had to be in a marriage relationship. What makes you a backslider is that you was in a marriage relationship and you strayed away from that relationship. As you strayed away, you begin to follow after other things. You then committed adultery against God. You violated that covenant. So when he says I'm married to you, he's not saying that you get to do whatever you want. What he's saying is at one point me and you were stronger. Our relationship was closer, but you strayed away from that relationship. Matter of fact, to make it simple, we were married. And so if somebody is watching me now, God is calling you back to himself, and, you're, and, and your frustration is you're not effective in the kingdom anymore. So now you're distancing yourself from the kingdom. You're more comfortable with people who are not chasing after the will of God. At one point, you were chasing after the will of God, and now you have reduced God to this, this, this concept of God being good. Here's the problem with, with just God being good. And we say the phrase, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Here's the problem that I have with that. The moment good stuff is not happening to you, you now question God because you have reduced him to God being good. God is good, but there's more aspects to God as well that deals with things that may not necessarily make us feel good. David said it uh, very, very well in Psalms 23. He says, when he walked through the valley of shadow of death. So, so in other words, God can lead you through the passage straight to the valley. You're headed to the mountaintop, but you're going to go through a season of testing. That's part of God too. And David is finding himself facing a Saul that once talked well of him that's now eyeing him. 
So in other words, that when, when Saul lays eyes on David, he starts feeling some kind of way. David ain't did anything. David's trying to do his best. Oh, let me tell you a secret. Even David's hard work actually would make Saul look better. Saul can't see it because of the internal struggle that Saul got going on on the inside of him. Stop worrying about how someone perceives or receives you when the truth of the matter, what's going on in them, can only be fixed by God. Quit allowing yourself to dumb it down so that people around you feel smart. God can be introducing you to another level. And you don't want to talk about the, next, the new thing that you're learning because you don't want the old people to feel some kind of way. So you don't go into the conversation that you really want to go into because they can't follow you, so they make you feel bad for throwing out terms and, and vocabulary and, and that they are not familiar with. Matter of fact, some of you have been there. You go around people that you haven't been around in a while, and they tell you how they really feel. They may dap you up and say, oh, there he go, there, there he go. You know what I'm saying? I thought, you know what I'm saying? We ain't seen you in a while. You know, we, you, know you think you're too good for us. They're actually saying, I don't like the fact that you're at the palace. Here's the thing that you got to be, be careful of if you're a first fruit. God will take you to the palace first. They would give their right arm to change places with you. If it was them heading to the palace, they'll cut you off. But it, because it's you heading to the palace, they will make you feel bad about growing. So David is finding himself being eyed by Saul. It says from that day forward, which means at, we can see the moment that Saul's heart shifted against David. And no matter what David does... Saul don't like him anymore. Who is it that at one point in your life spoke well of you, but today they may not like you? Stop praying that God fix the relationship. Maybe God has moved on, and maybe it's time for you to move on. The Bible declares in verse 10, and it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the mix of the house. Watch this. This is a perfect opportunity for me to give you a commercial break that when it says an evil spirit came from God, many times in the Old Testament, God would get the uh, accountability of something bad happening as if it was God's doing. But because it was uh, spiritual matters, they would automatically attribute those things to God when in actuality it wasn't God at all. Here's an example of that. So God did not give Saul an evil spirit. We understand that it was an evil spirit, so, and it came from, uh, it was a demonic spirit. God it wasn't from him at all. And, but here's the thing. It says Saul prophesied. Here's an issue of emotions versus spiritual maturity. <laughs> Just because a person is prophesying doesn't mean they're coming from the spirit of God. A person can prophesy and be led by a demonic spirit. How do we know? Is there prophecy laced with the word of God? Or is it emotional? See, many times, many of you are in a situation because you listen to a person who told you, thus says the Lord. They only told you what, what they really want God to say to them. So they'll tell you, you know, your, your, your this is on the way. They're telling you that because they really want somebody to tell them that their Boaz is on the way. So they just tell you first. They really want somebody to tell them that their car is on the way, so they tell you first. They really want somebody to tell them their house is on the way, so they tell you first. And you don't know that that person got something going on on the inside of them, that, they, that the, what they're doing on the back end, all you're just happy about, that they prophesy to you. They say, thus says the Lord. So automatically you contribute that thing to God. Here's a perfect example that a person can, can say that something comes from God when actually it wasn't God at all. How do you gauge it? The Bible says, I, first I look at your fruit. And I can gauge to see is, 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 is what you're telling me has the characteristics of God in it. Is it laced with the word? Is it coming straight from the word or is it coming out of emotions? Spiritual maturity. So because Saul is not spiritually mature, he's prophesying. Here's the crazy part. And David played with his hand. He, he, you know, he was a played instrument as at other times. So watch this, guys. David is still doing what he was doing before. Isn't it amazing how people say God elevates them, he matured them, he grow them, but you're too good to do what you used to do before? When do God anoint us from doing the small stuff? If cutting the grass was how you got the anointing, how is it now, Pastor, you too good to cut the grass? 
if cleaning the toilets is what you did to get the anointing, how is it you, you're too good to clean the toilets now? I thought it was that if we took care of God's house, he'll take care of ours. I didn't know there were stipulations to that. So now you may have to clean your own church. You may have to vacuum the sanctuary again, Pastor. You may have to clean the bathroom again. You may be, have to be the one to wipe everything down, mop the floor. Have you become too anointed to do that? I want to speak to that person who has backslid. You have strayed away from what God has ordained. As you listen to me now, you recognize, Lord, I forfeited some stuff that you wanted to do in my life. I blamed a whole lot of people why I don't go to church anymore. But the truth of the matter is my relationship with you start to lack. We laugh and, and say that you can tell from a leadership perspective, you can tell when people on their way out the door because they changed their seating. If they used to sit close to the front, they don't just leave. They go start dwindling in the middle. Then eventually they get to the back of the room until eventually they out the door. Backsliding is a progression. It doesn't happen overnight. I'm talking to that person who you would volunteer with no problem. But you let something taint your heart. And eventually it tainted you straight out the door. It's amazing that you don't want to fool with church people because they are fake, they're doing this and they're doing that. You got those same type of people at your job, but you won't leave there. You run to those same type of people at the grocery store, but you don't turn around and go to another one. You run to those same people at the gas station, but you still go and get your gas. My point is, stop making excuses. Your destiny is on the line. God could, ha could be interviewing you for kingship, and you're failing the test. I want you to come back to him. Wherever you are in your life, you can be in your living room. You can be wherever you're watching this at. You can be in your car. I'm concerned about you. And I'm hoping everything on the inside of you right now is, is going haywire. Because God is calling you back to your rightful place. Part of the grace of my life is Isaiah 29, 24, those who err in spirit shall come to understand, and those who murmur shall learn doctrine. I, I have a grace of my life to come against the spirit of perversion. Perversion means to deviate from God's original intent. I'm speaking to you today because I'm, I'm speaking to that thing that's holding you up, every demonic influence that's holding you from being who God's ordained for you to be. I come against now in the name of Jesus. The yoke of bondage is broken off your life, and the spirit of perversion has no authority over you. I command now for a loosening in your heart, a loosening in your mind. I feel the yokes of abundance being broken off your life through the power of God right now as I'm speaking to you. Here's what God is saying. You got to come back to me. I need that fire again. I need that passion again. I need that unwavering faith that you used to have. It's not over. You're still alive. It's your opportunity to get it right. So here's the thing that I'm asking you to do right now. If you're that person that God is speaking to, to come back to him, here's, here's the thing I need you to do. Right where you are, I want you just to open your heart. First thing I need you to do is, is to acknowledge that you messed up. It wasn't so-and-so fault. It wasn't a pastor's fault, assistant pastor. It wasn't the usher's fault. It was, it's on you. Lord, I strayed away. Lord, I stopped praying like I used to. I stopped fasting like I used to. I stopped studying your word like I used to. I allowed the cares of this life to entangle me. And my commitment to you waned. But I'm coming back to you. Thank you for giving me another chance. Lord, I pray that it's not over. I pray that I, I haven't been fired to such a degree that you have moved on from me completely. Thank you, Lord. If that's you and you're saying that, ask God to come back into your heart. Matter of fact, give him your heart again. Lord, I repent for straying away. If you accept me back, you, you have me all to yourself. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I know what my assignment is, and I'm ready to do it. No more excuses. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my mind. Let's renew our vows. I want to marry you again. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And I give you my heart. I'm coming back to you. If that's you, the Bible says angels in heaven are rejoicing that if one sinner comes back, my brother, my sister, is not over for you yet. 
I want to talk to that person that maybe you never know, knew that God is preparing you for kingship. Maybe you, you didn't know that, that God is pulling you away from what you used to do because he's trying to do something different in your life. God is speaking to you too. Here's the thing. Give him your heart. Lord, I give you my heart. I accept you as my Lord, Savior, God, and King. I believe that you sent your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. And I receive him as my Lord and Savior. Welcome to the family of believers. God's going to do something tremendous in your life. He's already begun it. He's just going to complete the work that he's already started. So we here at the Hand of the Lord International, we thank you for tuning in to us. We thank you for opening your heart. We thank you for taking the time to, to listen to this video. More important, I want you to look over the scriptures that you're going to see on the screen. Go back and read it. I want you to get it on the inside of your heart. Why? Because I believe that God is going to do a tremendous work in you. And it's not just about you because if David fails this test, Christ cannot come from his lineage. There's people depending on you who ha hasn't been born yet. May God bless you and increase you richly in Jesus' name. Thank you for tuning in.